They're bankrupting it. And, and look, at the end of the day, whatever your excuse is about what happened to Detroit, our trade agreements, major part of it. Uh, globalization, deindustrialization, the offshoring of good paying manufacturing jobs and the destruction of the American middle class. That's the reason Detroit's in the shape that it's in. It all comes back down to these horrible, insane trade deals, this neoliberal trade a regime that has taken hold of this country for the last 30, 40 years, and it's got to stop. But I don't see any time anytime soon because we're talking about probably the mother load of bad trade deals in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Free Trade Agreement. Here to talk to us a little bit about that is Matthew Alexander. He's a policy analyst over at Economy in Crisis, economyincrisis.org, the website. Matthew, thanks for taking time for us. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. So I look at the situation in Detroit, and I lay blame flat at at our bad trade policy, at our horrible, abysmal trade policies. Yeah, well, I think uh, as with anything in the real world, you're going to find a lot of causes and a lot of effects, but you've got to you've got to talk about the big ones, and I think uh, that's going to be part of it. We've seen uh, the industrial base slowly wither away in a lot of areas, and of course. Detroit has probably gotten the worst of it. You know, they say we've lost jobs. Uh, I don't think we've lost them. I think we know exactly where they are. They're in a lot of the countries where we've got all these these bad, these one-sided trade deals. And I, I shouldn't even say that because, you know, it's one-sided for Wall Street. Yeah, it's uh, and that's the problem. Obviously, trade can be a good thing, but it's how you handle it. And we're in a lot of trade deals right now, which are good for some parties, Uh not so good for others. Uh, the 1% makes off pretty well with a lot of these. Um, but then you have uh, a distortion in the market, uh, which would not otherwise occur when you have some of the conditions we have in our trade policies, and uh, someone's got to pay for it, and we know who that is. Now, I asked you here to come talk about the Trans-Pacific Partnership Free Trade Agreement, and I know you don't, you probably don't know the details of it because, what, there's only about 600 lobbyists who get to know anything. And, you know, when we talked to Alan Grayson at Netroots Nation, he said that, you know, he's seen it, uh, but he can't, can't tell us anything about it. So what do yeah. we know at this point? What, what, what is it looking like uh, from, from the, I guess, speculation, since we're not allowed to know, even though this president said it was going to be all about transparency? Well, one thing you can know right off the bat is if they're doing it in secret, there's a reason for it. Uh, they always tell us, uh, if you're not doing anything wrong, there's nothing to hide. Well, we can send that right back at them. If you're not doing anything wrong, what are you hiding? The very fact that they're hiding something tells us that there's something in there that they don't want the public to see. And I believe uh, Grayson himself said, uh, he can't talk about the details, but he said something to the effect of, if we saw them, we'd be horrified. Uh, so that, you know, whatever the actual details turn out to be, and, and nothing is set in stone yet, but whatever the details turn out to be, we're not going to like it. Well, I'm horrified by just the fact that I can't, I don't, I'm not allowed to know what's in it. That, to me, yeah. right from the start, huge red flag. And I don't care what side of the, the political divide you find yourself, whether you love Obama or you hate him, um, I want to know what it is because across the spectrum, it affects all of us. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that, that's a big issue. Even if a good trade policy came out of this, I would still protest the way they went about doing it. And, of course, a good trade policy is not going to come out of it. That's why it's being done in secret. We know who is sitting at the table, even if we don't know uh, what they're agreeing to. And the people sitting at the table, of course, are the ones who are going to benefit. And we've seen this with warfare, people making a profit while other people pay the expenses. Uh, the same kind of people are sitting at that table. And I think uh, that's what we're going to wind up with. Uh, if something isn't done about it. Well, let me ask you this, you know, in looking at the countries that are involved in this, uh, you know, the Vietnams and such, is it possible to have a free trade agreement with them that isn't going to destroy jobs in this country? Well, uh, you know, that free trade is a difficult term because it means different things to different people. Uh, if, you, if you're talking about NAFTA, yes. free trade, uh, no, that's, 
that's going to be highly problematic, of course. Uh, one thing that concerns me is cu- currency manipulation, which distorts the market. It makes it easy to buy their products coming in here. It makes it harder to buy our products going there. Now, that sounds all well and dandy. We eat cheap goods. The problem is uh, these other countries are subsidizing our consumption. That's not going to go on forever. So we get used to a lifestyle that's inflated, or some of us do, the ones with jobs, get used to a lifestyle that's inflated, and then all of a sudden, at some point, the rug's going to get pulled out from underneath us. So that's one. That's an example of one uh, potential problem uh, with this negotiation, especially those, uh, some of those countries in Asia do a lot of currency manipulation. And the other part of this is what I think most people don't seem to understand. You know, the whole cheap good thing, uh, not really good for us on a on a uh, on a trade deficit level. Or because to me, I think you know we we hear a lot about the 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 deficits in our budget and the debt, uh, which are, you know are, are problematic on on one level. But to me, the big deficit that I worry about more than anything is that trade deficit because that means there's money going out of this country to to, to around the world and. The, the dollar being the cons- the currency of uh, of the world, that money has to come back here in one form or another. And if we're not selling things to them, that means they're buying us. They're not buying our, our government. They're buying our corporations and breaking them down and shipping them over. So we're just we're selling off. Uh, we're selling ourselves off. Yeah, I think uh, the the problem here is how we come to it. Historically, there have been trade deficits that stuck around for a few years and they went away, they turned into a surplus and you had a little ebb and flow. What we're looking at here is a, a long term. I mean, since, since I was born, I think the U.S. has had a trade deficit and it's not a healthy one. We're talking about a distorting trade deficit where really they're funding our extra consumption, uh, giving us a lot of cheap goods, which you know, like a, an injection of heroin feels good uh, when you do it the first time. Uh, after a while, you're an addict. Uh, so they're funding our extra consumption. It's a distorting effect. There are a lot of industries where the U.S. should have a comparative advantage. Uh, and, of course, in economics, they talk about a comparative advantage. You do what you're good at. They do what they're good at. Right. You trade the surplus. You're both better off. Uh, there are some industries. I think steel is probably one of them where the U.S. should have a comparative advantage, and yet it's China that's producing all the steel. And okay, it, it's nice getting a little cheap steel, but the economy is not as well off as it should be because it's not a natural advantage the Chinese have. Uh, and, of course, there's nothing we can do about China, but we can do some things about uh, how we let the trade go on, right. and we're not doing a whole lot about it. And we're not doing any, in my view, I don't think we're doing anything to, to tap down the, the currency manipulation, not just by China, but by Japan as well. Yeah, Japan, I think the yen has been depreciated 30% just recently. Uh, for the first time, I, I don't know ever, but uh, typically uh, a dollar buy you 80 yen. Uh, now it buys, a penny will buy you more than one yen. Uh, so at, at least at one point recently, it went above a hundred. Uh, so they're they're manipulating their currency. And the IMF agrees too, but the IMF really has no enforcement mechanism. So I look at this and then I ask the question: You know, are we better off? You know, with with the way we're going, and and you know, I I sat twenty feet from from President Obama at, when he was candidate at Obama, where he said, "You can trust me." You know, you heard the clip. <laughs> trust me. Uh, strong environmental and strong labor. And yet I look at Korea and I look at Colombia and I look at Panama as the template of what I think, because uh, I can't, like like we've said, we, we don't know what the, the TPP is going to look like because we're not one of the 600 uh, lobbyists who are, are, are ordained to be able to be part of this. Uh, but judging from those three, uh, I don't have good hopes. No, I, I don't either. Uh, Obama has turned into uh, George W. Bush 2.0. Uh, George W. Bush himself was not the president uh, he said he was going to be when he campaigned in 2000. Uh, I think this is a theme we're going to see again and again, unfortunately, in American politics. I think every president we get is pretty much going to be the same guy. He's going to be bought by corporate interests, 
probably going to be some type of corporatist with small little liberal or conservative differences on the side. But the, the main heart of the economic plan is probably not going to alter. You know, and I look at this and I say, well, you know, there are a number of these countries in the uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that they're talking about that I don't know that you can you can have uh, the the kind of NAFTA type back and open borders relationship with. Uh, but I look at Europe and, you know, there's part of me that goes, you know, with the UK, with Germany, France, I, I think you can have some so, some uh, some back and forth there because, you know, similar standards of living and theirs are actually a little bit higher. Um, what are we seeing in, in, in relations to a European free trade agreement. Any, any talk on that? Oh, yes. In fact, uh, you, you referred to TPP as the mother load. Uh, there's a bigger one in the pipeline uh, going under different names, TAFTA. You usually see it, the transatlantic free trade area or agreement. Uh, if this uh, talks on that have just started, there's no reason to expect TAFTA to be significantly different from the TPP, which is not going to be significantly different from NAFTA or TAFTA or CORUS or any of these managed corporatist trade uh, agreements we get into. Uh, I, f I forget the figure I saw, but I think TAFTA is going to encompass, oh, did, was it 60% of the globe's economy or something like that? Wow. I mean, that, it's, it's huge. And it, it's going to be the same thing. Uh, it's going to be done in secret, I imagine, and you're going to see the same basic scheme. And what does that mean for the average everyday working person? I mean, you know, as as we've seen wages stagnate and actually go backwards the last 30 years, what's it going to mean for the average working person here in the U.S.? And, and as we're pitted against countries like Vietnam and Burundi or whatever the name, I can't even pronounce half of them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, and look, it's a geography lesson at, at its at its best, but it's a race to the bottom at its worst. Well, yeah, the race to the bottom, especially you see in standards. Um, the, honestly, one of the most maddening things about these are uh, the ability of corporations to sue governments uh, over uh, putative lost earnings. So let's say that we don't allow mercury above a certain level in fish let's say we have the standard and china allows it and the tpp gets passed and has this what's called an investor state dispute resolution so a chinese corporation which is probably just going to be an arm of the chinese government wants to sell fish here but the mercury levels are too high but not too high for china so this chinese corporation can go to a non-elected secretive body and file a complaint about what they would have been able to earn had they been able to sell in the U.S. And they're going to win because the, their standard in their own country is lower, and they're going to go by that standard. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, the perfect example of that, uh, back in the, you know, uh, I'm guessing it was right after NAFTA was passed, a couple years after, where a, a number of Indian tribes had sued tobacco companies uh, because uh, India, the country of India, had sued um, under the 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 uh, the idea that uh, we've got uh, youth youth smoking laws, mm. and they don't. <laughs> okay, I had not heard that one. Yeah, well, I mean, it sounds like it's about the same idea, and then we have to compensate them or our government has to compensate them for the putative lost profits calculated who knows how but of course the government doesn't have any money you and i do a little bit and so we get to pay for their lost profit uh this is this kind of thing is already going on there's a particularly nefarious aspect of this where if you don't like the regulations in your own country you open an office in a country with lower standards and now you're a corporation from that country, so you sue your own government. So what do we do on this? I mean, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it hasn't passed yet. There, there's got to be voices like Grayson's against it. There's got to be a way to, to put up, a, uh, you know, a, some type of a roadblock to, to at least get uh, this out into the open and to have an honest public discussion about it. What do we do? Uh, boy, what do you and I do? We keep doing what we're doing now. We hope uh, that the flame catches on somewhere and turns into a roaring fire, and we got to keep fanning the flames. 
Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm not overly optimistic. Um, there's too many rich interests that stand to benefit from this, and we all know uh, what happens in cases like that. But and that doesn't mean you give up hope. It doesn't mean you stop fighting. It doesn't mean that we can't do it. But right. we've we've got to turn the little flame into a bonfire. Is what we got to do. And we got to be talking to talking to each other. We got to be in the streets. Absolutely, in the streets and on the phones and whatever it takes. I and again, I mean, this is you know, this is this is this was the guy I voted for. Uh, yeah. And it's and it's just as bad as uh, as something that Bush would put forth. Uh, I, I don't see anywhere where it's better. Although I got to be honest, I'm not allowed to know. Yeah, well, the, you know, the Bush and Obama were bought by pretty much the same people, and they've been dancing to the same tune. Yeah, well, this is this is again back to that whole we need to get money out of politics so we can get honest, decent, regular, average Joes in and Janes into office uh, to be able to fight this stuff back. It's yeah, well, that idea. was the original vision, of course, of the founding fathers. You came in from the plow, did a little of the government's work uh, at the end of the day, and then went home to your family. Now, unfortunately, we have professional politicians, uh, and then we all know the trouble that uh, that's created. Again, the website, economyandcrisis.org, if you want to find more information on this and other uh, stories about our economy. Matthew Alexander, I appreciate the time. Thanks for taking hey, time for us. Thanks for having me. Uh, pl please come back again often. Uh, policy analyst over at Economy and Crisis. Let's take a quick break. Right back, 1-888-520-RICK, 1-888-520-7425. This is The Rick Smith Show.